Well, again, good evening, everybody. Evening. Anybody here ever build a house or have a house built, you custom sort of deal? You know, wouldn't it be great if they were totally anointed contractors that had done the job? I mean, really spirit-filled, anointed, attention to detail the whole bit. Well, tonight we're going to read about some called consecrated contractors called and consecrated, anointed by the Holy Spirit, these contractors, builders, craftsmen. And it's here in Exodus chapter 31. Now, as you know, for 40 days and nights, Moses was up on Mount Sinai, a miracle. He neither ate nor drank anything, which, you know, if you go, you can go several days without eating, but if you go just more than a couple few days without drinking water, you're going to, it's not going to be good. I'm going to die very quickly. So this was an absolute miracle of God sustaining Moses for these 40 days and 40 nights there on Mount Sinai. He received instructions from God about the construction of the tabernacle, that tent of meeting where God said he would meet with his people. As we've noted several times beforehand, the tabernacle was a shadow, a snapshot of a living heavenly reality. Everything about the tabernacle, including even the ministry of the priests and the various sacrifices, all speak of of two things. Number one, heaven. And number two, the king of heaven himself, Jesus Christ. So far we have read about the Ark of the Covenant with that lid on top, which was called the mercy seat. Also the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, the bronze altar, the actual tent of meeting itself, the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle, and also where everything was to go. And surprise, surprise, if you lay it out and drew a line around it, it looks very much like a cross. We also read about the clothing for the priests, including that breastplate that he wore that represented the 12 tribes of Israel that he wore over his heart because God loves his people. We last week read about the altar of incense and the bronze laver uh, where the priests would wash and also the anointing oil and then finally the incense that was burned on the altar of incense. Everything about the tabernacle was meant to employ all of our senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, and even taste. For as the sacrifices were offered, many of them, as parts were given to God, burned up, but then parts were given to the priest, that'd be kind of his pay, and then other parts that were roasted on the altar were then given to the offerer where he and his family would gather together. And so you'd have basically a barbecue. you have a get-together, with that sinner whose sins had just been covered by that sacrifice, the priests who mediated between God and man and God himself. So they're having a, a hoedown. They're having a, a, a big party throwdown because the, the symbolism was your sins are now covered. Because of the sacrifice that you're enjoying, you now have peace with God. And so that's what it was all It's all about Jesus. You know, the fellowship and the joy that we have in him. Uh, You know, some Christians portray themselves as very somber and very, you know, very serious and all. I think, man, you're missing the point, man. In Jesus, there's fullness of joy. There should be joy, excitement, the fact, hey, my sins are forgiven. I'm going to heaven. Wow. (laughs) What a deal. Such a deal, let me tell you. God takes my sins. He gives to me his righteousness. That's a fair trade on my, on my end. Not on his end, but on my end. And he's willing to do it, so I'm willing to let him, you know. And that just fills me with great joy. And so everything about the tabernacle, employing our senses, even so Jesus gave himself everything to save us from our sins and to bring us into his presence. We read in Ephesians 5, verse 2, Walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself, his everything for us. An offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Imagine just being there in those, those lambs and the, the rams and the, the doves and the, the, the oxen and all that are being slaughtered and sacrificed and burned on the altar and, you know, just a 
bunch of roasting meat. And what a sweet smelling aroma that is. Occasionally, I'll, I'll be at my house and I'll smell from a distance somebody, you know, cooking a pork shoulder or something. You could smell it from a few houses away. Oh, wow, it smells good. And then I'm wondering, why wasn't I invited? So, you know, it's, it's just a sweet smelling aroma. That's how God sees it. And God is so satisfied with the work of Jesus on our behalf. So satisfied, just, oh, wow, it's so good. So good. Sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. Now, at this point, God's plans were all in place. They were perfect, down to the minute detail. But the question remained, who's going to build this thing? You know, Moses, he's 80-some years old. Oh, yeah, he's able to go up and down on Mount Sinai several times, but still, he's, he's only one man, and this was a big job requiring lots and lots of people. Who was going to build these things, including the various ornate, intricate items, the, the pieces of furniture and all? Well, God had a plan all along, not just for the plans of the tabernacle, but for the people that he would anoint to carry out the task at hand. And in verses 1 through 11, we read about many modes of ministry. Now, you know, before we get started in this, when you think of ministry, so often we think, oh, of the pastor and the teaching and the, 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 the worship leading in songs and all, and, you know, we, the, the administration, the, the children's ministry, the men's ministry, the women's ministry. We think of those things, and, and yet... You know, keep in mind that ministry is much more than just the function of what happens up in the forefront, what you see. But there's a lot that takes place behind the scenes that's ministry, just as valuable to the Lord as, as a pastor teaching from a pulpit. And so we're going to look here at, at many, some, some different modes of ministry. Verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. God calls this guy. You know, each one of us has a calling or even callings upon our lives in service, specific service to the Lord. And God will anoint each one of us to do what he calls us to do, doing it with excellence if, if we will ask for the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. God will empower us to do what he's called us to do if we'll simply ask. Jesus said in Luke 11, verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And as I said, God has a calling on each one of us, a place of service or several places of service that he wants to anoint And we'll anoint if we ask, so that we can do what he calls us to do with excellence. We read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Every one of us called by God to receive the anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so that what we do for the Lord will be done with excellence. And it won't be a work of the flesh, but it'll be a work of the Spirit. And God wants to do this in us, and we'll do it if, again, we just simply, simply ask. So, the, the, the main lesson tonight is simply this. We're going to wrap it up right now, and you can all go home. <laughs> it's simply this. Ask God to show you what he has called you to do, specifically here at Calvary Chapel Bartlett. If this is your home church then God has something for you to do here at this church. Ask him what it is, and then ask him for the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that you can do it with excellence. That's it. That's the message. Good night. Have a pleasant tomorrow. (laughs) Well, let's go ahead and read on and see what else we can glean here. Verse 3, And I have filled him, this Bezalel, with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, And in all manner of workmanship, this guy was an unbelievable craftsman to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver, in bronze, lots of metal work, in cutting jewels for setting, a jeweler. So he's able to work in metals, able to work in jewelry, to do artistic work, and also in carving wood. 
and to do work in all manner of workmanship. This guy was a handy guy to have around. I bet his wife was constantly bothered by other women saying, can you have your husband come over and fix some things for me around the tent? Because this guy was just really, really gifted. Now, there are some people who do have a natural bent for doing certain things. You know, I can build some things. And when I build it, it'll last through the tribulation. I, I use way too, too big a wood, too many nails and screws and glue and all that stuff. But I have a very hard time at making some things pretty. By the way, that support beam and shelf, if you go into this room over here, you'll see what Jared and I built. And it'll last. You can drive a you can drive a pinto up on top of that thing and it won't collapse or explode. It might explode, but that's pinto's fault, not that. But it'll last, but it's not pretty. But some have a knack for making very beautiful things, very ornate. And then there are some others even higher than that, like Bezalel, who was anointed by the Holy Spirit, who can make and excel in things up and beyond even that of a normally skilled craftsman. Some people are just, and, and they, they know their calling and they're doing it for the Lord and they're able to do it with a wow factor that you step back and say, well, that had, I know he has a natural bent for those things or she has a natural inclination toward those things, but what has been accomplished there is nothing short of the Spirit of God. And we all have something that we can do that when we're doing it in the Spirit, for the Lord, people will step back and go, wow, wow. And all it takes is us to have a want to. Lord, I just want to know what you want me to do for you. And please fill me with your spirit so that I can do it well. It's very simple. And if we'll do that, others will step back and go, wow. And then they'll say it backwards, wow. So anyway... But notice that uh, the work that he was to do wasn't very churchy. I've, he didn't say, I've anointed Bezalel to get up and lead Bible studies or to lead worship or to do any of that stuff. No, it was in woodwork, metalwork, cutting jewels, jewelry, making jewelry for the kingdom of God. You know, different things. I, I hope that the Lord will expand our horizons and our, our view of ministry to include things that we might not normally consider, like painting, weed eating. By the way, if we don't get a lot of rain tomorrow, Friday, we're going to do some weed eating and lawn mowing in case anybody... I know there's a couple of guys here who are really good at it. And they get out there and they get on it, and it is really, really cool, the work that they do. And, you know, it's interesting. We step back after we're done doing that, and, and some of you guys are just, you're awesome at it. And we step back and we say, wow, this looks really neat. Too bad nobody's going to notice. <laughs> you know? Now, they, people would notice if we didn't do the yard work and it would be overgrown and all. But on Sunday mornings, most people just drive on by and don't notice. But the Lord notices. The Lord notices. And God takes note. And so there are anointed weed eaters, anointed cleaning and cooking and praying and showing compassion, just simply showing compassion, anointed, uh, giving even, or you name it. We can do what we do for the Lord and his people, asking him for the anointing. Anointed doctors who devote themselves to, to serving the Lord and ministering to those who you know, many times can't, can't pay. There's some, some, they don't necessarily do everything they do for free, but they do mission work, and it's a wonderful, anointed, anointed ministry. I ran into, um, when we went to Nepal one time, there was this other mission group. There was a dentist who for several weeks beforehand trained non-dentists how to clean out cavities and do some drilling with a hand drill and to fill teeth. 
and even do some extractions if necessary because over in Nepal, you don't have to be licensed to do that sort of thing. And, and the need there is unbelievably great, just dental work. And so these people who had never clean, had their hands in anybody else's mouth beforehand were over there after a few weeks of training by this dentist, crash course in dentistry, and they're drilling teeth and filling them and pulling teeth and doing all sorts of manner of work. Of, now, the real hard stuff the dentist would do, but the others were doing all that stuff anointed by the Spirit of God to do so. And they were sharing the gospel at the same time. And many people who couldn't pay a dime to have their their cavities fixed and their teeth fixed would come and they would listen to these people preach the gospel to them. And many people got saved. So whatever you do, I'm just a, how can God use me? Just pray that the Lord would show you how to use your gifts, your talents, and also that he would anoint you to use them so you can use them for, in, in excellence. And so this Bezalel, he was one of those guys. Verse 6, And I, indeed I, have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, another extremely gifted, anointed craftsman. And, not just the two of them, but several others, I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tab- and he lists the, the big list we've been through already, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, its mercy seat that is on it, all the furniture in its tabernacle, uh, the table, the utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offerings with all its utensils, the laver, its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priests and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place According to all that I've commanded you, they shall do. As I look at this, I see the Lord speaking to Moses, giving him the plans, and then Moses going to the people saying, here's what the Lord has commanded, and then God raising up people to fulfill not Moses' plans, but to fulfill God's plans. And I see this as a picture, as a pattern of the New Testament church. God calls a man to pastor a church. And God puts God's vision in his heart for, for a, a place. For example, he called, I believe he called me and told me to come here. A man might question that, but he told me to come here and, uh, and to start a church that would teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, because it wasn't very prevalent here in the Mid-South. There's not many churches that are doing that. And so that's the vision. Teach the Bible. All of it. Not just the parts you like, but all of it. And along the way, God will raise up people to assist in the fulfilling of that vision. And He'll anoint and has anointed people to assist in the fulfilling of the vision. Some people are here for a season Some people have been here for a long time. But everybody is called to seek after the Lord for his or her place in fulfilling the vision that God has given for Calvary Chapel Bartlett. And so my question tonight would be, what has God called you to do? If you don't know yet, pray. God will reveal it. And then also, while you're praying for the revelation, also pray for the anointing. But make sure in verses 12 through 17, you don't forsake rest. Get your rest. Get your rest. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbaths you shall keep for it is a sign. What is the Sabbath day for? It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, God had just called these skilled artisans and craftsmen. Maybe they thought, well, because we're serving the Lord, we're never going to get a day off. Oh, no, no. Not true. You get a day off to do nothing. Leave the work behind. Go rest. Do what you want to do on your day off. It's for you. Don't sin, of course, but, but go and take it easy. Leave the work alone for at least a solid day. 
But notice that the Sabbath day was not just a day of rest for man. It was also a reminder to the people that they belonged to God. Again, in verse 13 at the end, it says that you may know that I am the Lord. So to know that they belong to God. Also, it was a testimony to others that the true and living God gave his people rest. And another thing, a third thing, was it foreshadowed the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. The Sabbath day foreshadows the rest we have in him. In Hebrews 4, verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Not a rest in the sense of ceasing from our jobs, but resting in the sense of not striving after trying to earn a righteous standing before God. There remains a rest where we stop trying to work for something we could never earn anyway. For he who has entered his rest, God has done the work, has provided this place of rest, he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. I'm not working to earn salvation because I already have it. It's tough enough to work one time for something, let alone work two times for that something. I don't want to labor twice. I don't hardly want to labor once, but I certainly don't want to labor twice for the one thing. I want to cease from that once I have it. Well, I'm not even to work once for my salvation because Jesus has already done that. For me to work on top of that, is to not enter his rest. When you get a knock on the door and you open up and there's that 19, 20-year-old elder, you know, pimple-faced elder, and the bicycle nicely parked outside and the tie and all, and, and hi, we're with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you get on the issue of salvation, and they'll say that it's by works. And you'll say, but the Bible says it's by grace that we've been saved through faith that not not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And they'll say, we believe, in fact, this one young man told me this, we believe that we're saved by God's grace, but we believe God's grace takes us so far, but then it's up to us to work the rest of the way. God's grace meets us at our place of our good works. I said, really? But he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So you haven't ceased from your works, therefore you're still out. So I, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You all trust in Jesus only for your salvation, and good for you. But you'll run across people who will say they're saved because they're good people or they're, they're, they're trying hard and, and they're, they're working. Well, just remember this verse here in Hebrews chapter 4, that the saved are those who have ceased from their works and have entered into his rest. Because God ceased from his work. He created the world in six days, seventh day he ceased. It didn't need to be added to. It was already done. Even so, our salvation is already done. So, this testimony of the Sabbath day to ultimately point to Jesus and the Sabbath rest that we have in him. Verse 14. And you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you, Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Oh, really? And by profaning it means if you decide, well, I'm going to put in some extra hours of work today. God says, no, no, you're going to die. The people are going to kill you. (laughs) Whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Even the sincere person who believes that he or she must do something to earn salvation will also be cut off from God forever. So sincerity doesn't, you know, the sincere person, I need to do some extra work to get ahead a little bit. They're sincere, but they're wrong. And God says, no. So the sincere person trying to work for salvation will also be cut off from God. Verse 16, therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Who? Who's supposed to observe the Sabbath? The children of Israel. This is their covenant. That's why in the New Testament we're told that one man views one day higher than another. Others view every day alike. Let everyone be convinced in his own mind. In the New Testament, to the Gentile church, 
The Sabbath day is not a requirement. It's not the law for us. But the Jews, however, were given this. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, the reason I emphasize that is there is the, the, the group, the Christian group, the Seventh-day Adventists, who believe that God should be worshipped on the Sabbath, on Saturday. And they're called Sabbatarians. Now, that's fine if they want to do that. But if they assume that they are more holy because they worship on the Sabbath and we worship on Sunday, then, then that's not true. That's not right. That's wrong. That's, they're trying to work for something by saying we observe the Sabbath and therefore they've not entered into God's rest. They're still looking at the Sabbath as a requirement and it's not. And, and besides, if somebody is observing the Sabbath here, the Sabbath has already come and gone in Israel because of the time change. So really, if they want to be technical and worship on the Sabbath as the Jews are supposed to in Jerusalem, in Israel, they should start like Thursday evening. Just saying. Anyway, Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel, not the church. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance of Christ. So somebody comes along and lays their trip on you. You should worship on the... In fact, some will even say that Sunday is the mark of the beast. Have you ever heard that? Sunday, they, they believe, some believe that Sunday is the mark. If you're worshiping on Sunday, you have received the mark of the beast, my friend. Wow, really? I would question them. Why are you worshiping the shadow instead of the substance? You know, let go of your shadow. It's like that song, me and my shadow. That's what they're worshiping. I'd rather worship the substance. And so then Moses says, you know, observe the Sabbath throughout your generations, Israel. And when he had made an end, verse 18, of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone. These two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Wow, how cool that would have been. They didn't last long. You know, they came to a quick end, and we're going to read about that here in a little bit. But imagine, 40 days and 40 nights with God, you get to take home a souvenir. Two tablets with the very finger of God written, carving out on those stones the Ten Commandments. The plans for the tabernacle and the Ten Commandments. Here comes Moses down from the mountain. I wish we could at this point say, they did what they were supposed to do, and everyone lived happily ever after the end. Wouldn't that be nice? Exodus 32, Aaron creates a counterfeit. Aaron, what are you thinking, buddy? Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain... Moses is having this unbelievable, awesome retreat experience. And while that's what's happening, the people down on the bottom, here's what they were doing. The people gathered together to Aaron, this is Moses' older brother, who was tapped by God, even as Moses is receiving from God instructions for Aaron, your brother, he'll be the high priest, and here's what he's to do on Yom Kippur. He's getting all these instructions for Aaron, the future high priest. At that time, Aaron is doing one of the worst sinful things that a person could ever do. Not only was he himself involved in sin, but he's including the entire nation in that sin. I mean, that's bad. It's one thing if our political and social leaders want to sin, but when they say that sin ought to be celebrated and they're pushing their immorality on our society, boy, oh boy, oh boy, that's really bad. 
Jesus said, it is impossible that no offenses should ever come, but woe unto him by whom those offenses come. It would be better if they were to hang a millstone around their neck and be cast into the sea than that they should offend one of these little ones. It's one thing if the, if, if the pornographer Hugh Hefner had just lusted on his own, but to spread his filth upon our society for the last couple generations, I sure hope that man repents. I sure hope he gets right with Jesus before he dies. Because woe unto him for misleading so many people. So people saw that Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain. The people gathered together to Aaron and said, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up, man who brought, man who brought us up, out of, what was wrong with that statement? Moses brought us out of Egypt? It wasn't Moses, it was the Lord. As for this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Oh, we know God called him up on Mount Sinai, but maybe God killed him. I don't know. We're tired of waiting. You know, in chapter 24, Moses said to the elders, as he was ascending, he said, wait here. Don't do anything. You know, just stop. Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. That was kind of a mistake. <laughs> yeah, take your issues to Aaron. Well, here they do. But it was a bad issue. You know, make us gods. Oh, no, there's only one God. Uh, you know, Moses led us here. and No, it was the Lord who led you there. People were tired of waiting. So they wanted some new God. The old God, he's, he's not hanging around us, so we need a new God, something hip, trendy. Maybe even something retro like the Egyptian god Apis that was depicted as a, as a cow. And Aaron said, so they come to Aaron, and Aaron should have said, y'all are nuts. Go back to your tent. Wait like Moses said. Don't be dumb. But he didn't. He said, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. These were treasures that they had received from the Egyptians that were eventually to be melted down in order to make the things of the tabernacle. But before that could happen, here Aaron is asking them to give them their golden earrings. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. He spent some time on this. He put effort into this and making this idol. Then they said... This is your God, O Israel, who has brought you out of the land of Egypt. Isn't it interesting how in one sentence they nullified in their minds the great work of God? The, just in one short sentence, they wiped away all of the miraculous things that God had done for them. The ten plagues, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, the manna every day, the many miracles in the wilderness, including water coming from the rock, and on and on and on. Here, here's, here's my takeaway. We have got to be careful about nullifying the works of God through unbelief. We have a difficult time, a rough patch, and we become worried about that thing. I don't know how I'm going to make it. And that one little sentence we have in our minds nullified all of the great things that God has done for us in the past. Has he not been faithful to you this far? Yeah. Is he going to say, oops? Is he going to let you, is he going to drop you? No. He is faithful to complete the work that he has begun in you. So, and I'm speaking to myself just as much as anybody else. The moment we become worried and concerned about this thing or this situation and we focus on it in, in our minds, we're nullifying what God has done in the past. That's why we read that the Lord shall keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on him because he trusts in him. 
Keep your eyes on Jesus. Trust in him. You'll be at peace. But the children of Israel in that one stupid sentence, this glob of gold that looks like a little baby cow, this is the one who brought us out of Egypt. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And in verse 19, he explains you know, what an evil heart is. We see that they, Israel, could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief kept them out of the promise and they would not trust God, they would not obey him, did not believe that he would protect them. So God says, fine, you won't trust me, then you're not going in. The children that you're so concerned about, they'll be the generation that goes in, but you, you're all going to die in the wilderness during the next 40 years because of unbelief. So then they build this golden calf. The people say, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then and Aaron saw it. Aaron, what are you doing? He built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. You notice in your Bibles that it's all caps, L-O-R-D, all capital letters there? He says, tomorrow, so they're looking at this golden calf, but then he says, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh, Jehovah. We're worshiping this, and also tomorrow we're going to worship him too. See what they're doing? Trying to mix the two. Aaron's trying to, oh, we're going to worship God too. Yeah, you can worship that, but we're going to worship God too tomorrow. Reminds me of those with a bumper sticker coexist. Trying to mix that which is unmixable. Trying to, you know, mutually exclusive things. Trying to, trying to put them together. Just not going to happen. So then they rose early on the next day. They offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, So they did their time with the true and living God, but then the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, to play immorally in the worship of this golden calf. And then in verses 7 through 14, God almost destroys Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Go get down for your people. (laughs) Any of you... uh, Stay-at-home moms, your kids act up, and then your husband comes home. What do you say to the husband? Your ch- do you know what your son just did today? Not my kid. When he's a good kid, he's mine. When he's a bad kid, he's yours. And that's kind of what the Lord is saying here. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Now remember, when God gave the Ten Commandments, The people proclaimed all that the Lord has said we shall do. And the commandment number one, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make any graven image. Commandment number two, no idols of anything that is in heaven above, on the earth, under the earth. You shall not bow down and worship it. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting that iniquity upon the children of the third and fourth generations because you hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So commandment one, there's only one God, no other. Commandment number two, don't make an image. Don't bow down to it. Don't worship it. They broke them. They broke all the commandments in this. Adultery, lying, stealing, covetousness. They broke them all. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. Don't say anything now, Moses. Stand aside, Moses, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. And by the way, if God had done this, who, who could have blamed him? After all, 
He is righteous. And he did say, sin brings forth death. And so God tells Moses, step aside, I'll nuke them all, and then I'll start with you afresh and make a new nation out of you. And if I'm Moses, I'm thinking, sounds good to me. The will of the Lord be done. But those people should be glad that I was not Moses. He's a better man than I am. He mediated for the people. Verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Not mine, God. They're your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak? And say, oh, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountain, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Lord, if you do this, then the Egyptians are going to think, oh, you're a God who gets them out only to destroy them. Turn, Lord Moses says, turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Hey, God, your reputation's at stake. If you destroy Israel now, the Egyptians will conclude that you're a mean God. You got them out to kill them. And that you can't finish what you begun. You got them out, but you couldn't get them in the promised land. And then issue number two. Remember your promises of the past. Abraham, Isaac, Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, plural, and they shall inherit it forever. So you gave past promises If you destroy Israel, then people will know you are a God who doesn't keep your word. You don't want that, do you, Lord? And if Moses was the only survivor, he was only from the tribe of Levi. The other 11 tribes would have been wiped out. And by the way, what tribe did God promise the Messiah would come from? Judah. So if God wiped out all of Israel except for one Levite, Moses, where would the Messiah come from? By the way, are these thoughts that God had never thought of until Moses brought this to his attention? Is God like, oh, oh, never thought of that. Hmm, interesting. Oh, yeah, I see your point, Moses. Is that what God was saying? No, not at all. But God, you know, always does keep his promises, his word. And notice in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. So what we see transpiring here, can, if, if Malachi 3, 6 applies, which it does, then what we see in this discourse between Moses and God is not Moses changing God's mind. Something else is going on. I'll do my best to try to explain it in a second. But know for sure, Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, all of them, including the tribe of Judah. So Moses gives God these three objections. Number one, the Egyptians are going to think you're mean, can't fulfill what you've begun. Others are going to think that you can't keep your promises. And where's the Messiah going to come from? Those three things. So, verse 14, the Lord relented. He was going to. But then, now he's not going to. The Lord relented from the harm with which he said he would do to his people. Isn't this a fascinating verse? What does it mean when God relents? What does it mean when we relent? It's different than what God does. I love what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say. When we try to, even the, the, the penman of Scripture, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when they wrote about what God feels... They could not, with human words, accurately describe what God feels. We can, with human words, describe what we humans feel. 
But what God feels and what God thinks is so far above us, there's just no way on this side of eternity we could even begin to comprehend all that goes on in God's mind and in God's heart. And so when it, here in the Bible it says God relented, don't think of it in the same way that you and I might relent, where we're bent on doing something, but then all of a sudden we are convinced otherwise and we change our mind. That's man's perspective. But what God did here is something very different, and I don't know exactly what it was that he was thinking or feeling or, or the relenting that he did here. There are many scriptures that clearly do declare that God does not change his mind. Like here, Malachi 3, 6. I am the Lord, I do not change. So, could there be, could it be that there is something else about this discussion between God and Moses that there's more than meets the eye? Is there something going on in this discussion that has more to do with God saying he's going to destroy Israel and then deciding not to after Moses prays? I think there is something much more than meets the eye. You remember the tabernacle, a static copy on earth of a living reality in heaven. All agreed on that, right? Okay. I don't think that the picture ended with chapter 31 when God says, instruct Bezalel and Aholiab and all these guys to build the tabernacle. Here's the plans, here's the Ten Commandments, get to work. I don't think that's where the picture ends. I think the, the heavenly reality is further shown to us in the picture of chapter 32, specifically with Moses. He represents more than just a go-between between God and Israel. I think that Moses, and here I go thinking again, I think Moses is reminding us of what is happening right now in the heavenly realm as Jesus is interceding for you and me. God who is within his full rights, the Father within his full rights to just destroy us all, and who's going to argue? <laughs> but yet there is a go-between, a mediator, who is standing in the gap, praying, interceding for you and me. And Hebrews, uh, well, I should have said that earlier. Um, well, we're really, where's the Hebrews one? I don't have it. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's Hebrews 7.25, which speaks of what Jesus is right now doing for you and me. He's praying for us in the place of Moses. Moses was a snapshot. Jesus is the heavenly living reality. And so Jesus is the one standing between us and the Father, claiming that God is just and the justifier of those who believe in him because Jesus was punished in our place. And so I see Moses interceding for the people as a type of Christ. And that's why God relented from destroying Israel because there was an able mediator. Even so, God relents from destroying us and our sin because Jesus is our fully able mediator. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus is praying for me right now. Very glad. Now, in verses 15 through 29, Moses rebukes the people and his stupid brother Aaron. Verse 15, Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of testimony were his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other. They were written, <laughs> just to clarify, on both sides, one side and the other. Now, the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God and engraved on the tablets. The emphasis there, it's all from the Lord. The law was not man's creation, it's God's creation. Now when Joshua, and he was far off, he was not very high up on the mountain. Moses comes down finally. Um, Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. But he, Moses said, it is not the, sh the noise of the shout of victory, 
nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. Now that's a party. It's not a war, that's a party going on. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger became hot. Now some people have a hard time with Moses saying he had a hot temper and that it was bad. No, 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 this was totally appropriate. He did the absolute right thing. His anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Why? I think symbolically, to show Israel they had broken God's commandments already. The ones they swore to keep, they broke them all in this moment of evil. And he took the calf with which they had made, burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder. And he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Why? Why did he make them drink it? Well, the way my mind works, and it's not a very pleasant way, but it works this way anyway. If you ingest something, what happens the next day to that which you ingested? It's got to come out of you, right? So here's Israel the next day. I'm sure their stomachs were upset that whole night having all that extra metal in their body. And then their body processes it. And I know that people don't like to hear this, but I think it's a very appropriate lesson. They go to potty. They look at their potty, and it's speckle and shiny and stinky. And God was saying, that's what I think of your idols. A bunch of shiny, stinky poop is what your idol worship is all about. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Moses said to Aaron, now, so Moses does this, and then he goes to Aaron. And he says, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Did they torture you? They must have threatened your family with bodily harm, Aaron. Why would you even do this thing? And so Aaron says, well, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. Well, you know, you know the people. It's the people. The people. They are set on evil. Man, who does he remind us of? Remember Adam and Eve? Adam saying to God, well, it's the woman you gave me, so it's her fault and your fault. And then to Eve, what have you done? Well, it's the serpent, his fault. It's not my fault. Always passing the buck. For they said to me, so it's the people, they're set on evil. They said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so I said to them, well, whoever has any gold, let him break it off. And they gave it to me. I cast in the fire and the lamest excuse ever. This calf came out. You got, that's your story? That's your story? And if your children, when they were young, do something, you know they did it and they lied about it. And they said, well, the, 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 the dog did it. You know, yeah, right. The dog ate my homework. Or it was my sister. Your sister's six weeks old. She couldn't have done anything. So it was a miracle. Moses it was, it threw gold in the out, pops this calf. And if you had been here too, you also would have danced around it naked just like the rest of us. You just would have if you had been here. And when the Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, and that word in the old King James is naked, unclothed, it very well could have been. In fact, in the worship of many of the pagan gods, the reason that the worship of pagan gods was so attractive to people is because they encouraged fulfilling the lust of the flesh. The goddess Ashtart among the Greeks was worshipped with a thousand temple prostitutes. And so that's why those temples are so popular. It's because you go and fulfill the lust of your flesh and think that you're religious by so doing. And so it's a miracle. Now when Moses saw the people were unrestrained for Aaron and not restrained them to the shame among their enemies. Oh, the enemies found out about it. What a shame. You know, it's such a shame when the enemies of God hear about the horrible things that some of God's people do. Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and said, This is amazing. Whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. So if you haven't been involved in this junk, you come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. 
And so the Levites, they, they remain pure. And he said to them, except for Aaron, the, the chief Levite, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side, go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. Let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. Whoever you know for sure that has worshipped these false gods and that is not sorry for so doing, kill them all. Really? Kill, kill everyone, even if it's a brother or a sister or father, or son. Whoever does not, we read in Scripture, whoever does not, the, does not love the Lord Jesus is accursed. You know, sin's a serious thing, and I, my takeaway from this is I don't need to go out and kill sinners. I need to make sure I've killed sin in my own life. Not try to reform it, not try to change it. No, kill it. Kill sin. The sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man is opposed to his son and his brother. Sin brings forth death, no exceptions. God wants us to radically eliminate sin from our lives. Then in verses 30 through 35, Moses intercedes again. Came to pass on the next day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, that would be good. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. Wow, Moses was willing to take their place in judgment. Beautiful picture of Jesus, isn't he? But God wouldn't accept Moses as a substitute, but he has accepted Jesus. The Lord says, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. When a person wants to accept Jesus, then they're, they're in his book. But if not, they don't accept him, they're not in his book. Now therefore, go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will, pun I will visit punishment upon them for their sin, which was pretty quickly afterwards because in verse 35, so the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. So initially, about 3,000 people died that day at the hand of the Levites, or as we call them, the, the sword-wheeling ninja priests. And then this plague hit. And an undisclosed number of people died in it. And all who were 20 years old and above coming out of Egypt eventually died in the wilderness except for two people. Who were they? Caleb and Joshua. That's right. James tells us sin brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. If you're a believer in Jesus your sins have been cleansed. You're going to heaven. There is zero you need to worry about. But what about the sin in your unbelieving family and friends? Strap the sword of the Spirit to your side. Go to them. Wield it. Tell them. Take the sword of the Spirit out and say, Thus says the Lord, whoever does not Believe in him. will be judged. Whoever does not love the Lord Jesus, he is accursed. Turn from your sin, repent, and believe on Jesus, and you'll be saved. It's time for us to strap the sword on and go out and use it. So, Father, thank you for your word tonight. We do pray, Lord, that you would show us individually what it is that you've called us to do. And we also pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth and do those things that you've called us to do. And Lord, also that you would help us to be bold and to, to go forth to family and friends and neighbors and co-workers with the word of God, telling them the truth, Lord, because if they, they die without you, as you know, they're going to have an eternity apart from you. Lord, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our intercessor. 
Thank you, Lord, for reminding us tonight you ever live to make intercession for us. Therefore, you save us to the uttermost. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...